I mean, I, I think it was uh, Coyote who was comparing politics to football. Um, the only thing is just that in football, at least the rules are clear. And oftentimes, uh, sometimes VAR uh, makes it even clearer. You know, if there is a you need to review, people can go back to VAR and see what happened. I mean, the referee can. Um, I don't know. VAR, which is the typology of INEX. INEX, uh, <laughs> IREV, which did not quite work on the day. They still haven't finished the upload. I'm, well, I'm INEX surprised. said, I think, uh, last week that it was way past 90%. So at least 90% of the results are. I thought it was supposed to be 100%. Uh, on, yeah, so, well. Uh, there are big questions, really, but uh, I think the promise that we we'll we get from the INEC chairman is that it will work this coming weekend. Oh um, boy! So we'll see how that eventually plays out with the state go uh, governorship elections and state house of assembly elections. Uh, but for the people who are discouraged, we continue to say, look, even the progress that has been made did not come easy. So if you're discouraged now, what should the people who have been in the kitchen since fighting for electoral reforms? This IRF did not come on a platter. It came because people kept on pushing and asking for it. The Electoral Act before 2015, I beg your pardon, yes, uh, after 2015, I think it was for 2019, was not signed. And after that, you know, people still didn't give up. They pushed again after 2019 and they eventually got their wish for 2022. Don't forget that I think it was sometime in January, uh, 2022, that the president signed this new electoral act, which mm -hmm. put in place this IRF that we're all talking about. So people shouldn't give up. Um, even after, you know, even after you've seen transparent elections, even if the candidate whom you wanted won the elections or wins the elections in your state, in your assembly, you have to keep engaging. Uh, because often, <laughs> I think it's Bishop Cooker who was making the analogy between um, you know, politics and marriage, um, and how he says that it's not the wedding day that is the... Um, so even if you have the best results on, ele on, on, the, on election day, the marriage is actually what we need to work on. What is happening after these people have been elected? What happens thereafter? Um, I, I, well, I, I hope that we, we see some sense in that and know that we have to keep engaging the process. What happens in the National Assembly? How are your budgets prepared, et cetera, et cetera? Because part of what we're seeing, after we finish all of the uh, bruhara over our elections, we'll still see that we're back to fuel queues. We're back to the fact that there is still no currency for people to spend. Um, never mind the Supreme Court judgment, which came on Friday and, and said that there should be um, an extension of spending of old notes to the 30th of December this year. Um, I think the last I heard was that the CBN says they've not yet seen that, they've not seen the Supreme Court order. So we do not know how it's going to be interpreted this week. We'll wait for that interpretation. Whether the president is going to make another statement, it's unclear. But I do know that these are some of the challenges. How have you been coping without currency? Has it affected you in any way? Uh, for those who have to take public transport, have there been new, because we've been hearing that there are new innovations that even some bus drivers have brought on. Um, have you experienced it? Do you think this is something that can work on the long run? Let us know what your thoughts are and let us know what your plans are to survive this week of fuel scarcity. Uh, whatever it is, we sincerely hope that you have a great week and we hope that this weekend uh, you'll come out to vote because really the state government and, well, it's not local government elections, but really uh, government that is closer to the people is where you actually feel the effect of where government is. And that's one of the reasons why there have been, you know, calls that the federal government needs to devolve more power to the states so that state governments can take more action, they can be more autonomous. Same thing for local governments, so that people can feel governance at that level. But let us know whether you'll be going out to vote this weekend. You don't have to tell us who you're voting for. That is your prerogative, you know. Uh, but sincerely, we sincerely wish you a great week ahead. Gentlemen. Well, what better way to actually uh, start the week uh, than with that, uh, I imagine, that prayer for Nigerians. But, you know, I actually tested uh, that Supreme Court judgment in court uh, yesterday. I wanted to see uh, just how well people are aware, especially traders, are first aware of that Supreme Court judgment and whether or not <laughs> they would obey it. Don't forget, as you said, CBN says they've not gotten the judgment. And I, and I tried to bring out the 500 Naira note, the old one, <laughs> for, for a trader. Well, I had a smile on my face, so you wouldn't think I'm trying to cheat you. And the guy goes, 
Like, what's that? <laughs> this doesn't work here. <laughs> this is contraband, band, uh, right here. <laughs> I know. I smiled and I put it back in my pocket. So, uh, to that extent, uh, well, even the CBN says they've not gotten a memo. Imagine uh, the average Nigerian or mm. business person out there. So, I mean, uh, that's uh, on the one hand. And I like the point you made, really, about uh, people getting actively involved in governance beyond elections. Elections, I would say, maybe, yes, it's a major part of governance. It's when the people's voices are heard when they go to the ballot. But it's not all of it. I wouldn't put a percentage to it, but I'm very sure it's not even half of governance. So while a lot of people go to the courts, try to reclaim their mandate, as they have said, by the way, uh, it looks like VAR is, um, well, IREV is like a VAR, but I think that the Supreme Court, or at least going to the tribunal, is also some sort of I am VAR, because that's when you try to review all of the results. Maybe there are like three levels of VAR. Here. Yeah. So first of all, there is section 65. Okay. It gives INEC <laughs> seven days. <laughs> that's one VAR. That's VAR first level. <laughs> VAR one. <laughs> then there is the uh, petitions courts, yeah. you know, uh, there the is tribunal. VA, the, the tribunal, and then whatever else. But ultimately, uh, what's important is, you know, that at least there is some form of review process yeah. for the whole thing. Indeed. Mm. I, I visit Visited the uh, <laughs> IREV. <laughs> I need to get out of it. I visited IREV almost more than I visited social media platforms. And, and I look forward to a time where IREV will be like Nigeria's electoral social media platform, mm -hmm. where there'll be more. I mean, yeah. Ineka said this is like the biggest election uh, uh, repository, yeah. really, the archive. So uh, we checked <laughs> earlier uh, and yeah. we saw that just about uh, how many results? 2,000 or that's, thereabouts. That's just about 92% or, or, <clears throat> or so. So we still have 8% to go. But basically, people need to actually get involved with this process beyond the election. So hold uh, your, well, we're going to the state assembly elections now. Hold your state <clears throat> assembly reps accountable. Hold your national assembly reps accountable. Your governors, <clears throat> even the president across board. Let us actually get this right. I'm excited with the excitement or by the excitement of young people and I really hope that the next four years will be something different, whichever way it swings, that is. You know, every one of us here have talked about governance one way or the other. And I think we need to understand where governance really happens. Governance doesn't happen in the office of the governor or of the office of the president. Governance happens through the ministries, departments and agencies. And I think I have mentioned it here <laughs> quite a few times that um, the federal government, as of two years ago, had 941 of those ministries, departments, and agencies, according to uh, Ben Akabo of, of the Budget Office, and 540-something corporations of the federal government, money-making mills of the federal government. So 1,484 ministries, departments, and agencies of government, including corporations. That's where governance happens, and that's the place we need to begin to interrogate. Federal government has a system called Servicom, so where you are supposed to uh, ask questions about why am I not getting this particular service, why am I not getting that particular service. Let us take them on from that level. Mark, you talked about local government systems. You are absolutely spot on. But how many of us are really asking the appropriate questions? So something happens and the, 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 the policeman deals with you in a particular way and we're, we're pointing at the federal government, the president or the governor. No. Call out the DPO. Call out the, the commissioner of police in that state. I think let's, let's let the system know that Ultimately, this is where power resides. But the most important thing, as Malcolm said, let's know that we need to have a nation that is at peace before we can have a, a nation that we can be proud of, that we can have a president or a governor. I think these things are all intertwined one way or the other. Chamberlain? Yep. To do that is come up this Saturday and finish what you started. You know, since we've just done the first part, the second part will be this Saturday. And it will be, it should be interesting, I tell you. Yeah, so that's uh, Let's go ahead and take you through some of the dailies. We'll start with Vanguard newspaper today. Supreme Court ruling, that's the theme. Uncertainty as banks wait on CBN. You know, uh, a lot of people still have their old notes anyways. So they, I, I think some of them are not faced by all that back and forth that was making the rounds because what could they do? There were, some people never even got to hear all of what was going on before they even heard it and made out time to go to the banks. The deadline had caught up with them. So they could blow out their cheeks and sigh of relief 
when the Supreme Court ruling came through. But look at the writers now. We can't reissue old notes without CBN directive, says banks. Mm. Say CBN takes directives from the president. Mm. And then reissue old notes immediately to reduce suffering stakeholders. So that is what, uh, as the big lead and uh, some of the riders you see here this morning. And um, it's not over <laughs> until it is. And then battle for stakes. Presidential NAS polls results raise stakes for gov, what, governorship, assembly elections. That's just what that is about, basically. So I think I like what I saw over the weekend. Lots of people comparing the results from their polling units on IRF. That's the way to go. Keep doing that. That's, uh, I mean, the nation belongs to everyone, you as well. They all have one vote, one equal rights as everybody else does. So that is what you have to do. Now you know that you have demystified all of those high falutin phrases they use in politics and tell, no, it's about you actually. And when you go out there and do that, nobody can tell you anything else. The only best person that can discourage you, guess who, is you. Yeah, that's the way it is. Oh, look at this. Certificate of return like World Cup trophy to me. Tinubu, mm, why not? And then, speaking about petrol, uh, NNPC declares 35 days sufficiency with 1.2 billion liters per wait, 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 wait. I think the last about a week or two ago, NNPC declared sufficiency. How do we still have few queues for goodness sakes? Look, I'm going to uh, <laughs> give myself high BP or anything about this because, look, we have to find a way to solve this out. Well, that will be for Vanguard this morning. Well, leadership has this. Um, the lead story there, believe it or not, lobbying for appointment in Tinubu's presidency begins. Mm -hmm. That's the lead story there on the front page. Women want 50% slots. Oh. That's, um, yes, that's what you're seeing there. Give us F city minister, natives, tell president elect. Okay, um, don't forget that uh, there's still controversy as to what the status of the F city is um, and whether or not um, a winner has to win 25% in the F city as well. I know that that has caused some controversy um, amongst lawyers. And if the F city is clarified or is said to be a state, then the question is, or acting like a state, then the question is, um, should they have a minister? Um, and if they should, well, I, they can have a minister, but the question is, does the minister have to be the minister of the FCT? That's a big, that's a big question. Uh, because when you're appointed from your state, you don't go to superintend over your state. You are superintend in the Ministry of Government. So let us see what happens there. Uh, give us FCT minister, native still president-elect. Northeast leaders call for broad-based government. Serve all Nigerians who voted for you. That's according to AKT, APC. Uh, you find details on page four of the paper. The picture there is also telling its own story. The president is somewhere in Doha, Qatar for United Nations conference. Uh, you also see there, resist injustice. Serve Nigerians, Oshibajo tells clerics. That is also on the front page. Gunmen kill DPO, village head in Zamfara, Kano. The story is on page 13 of the paper. And talking about fuel, federal government can generate 10 trillion naira from fuel forex subsidies removal. Okay, it's a page 8 read. I do know that, look, um, Jimeline, whoever wins, I mean, the president elect, if he survives all that, you know, happens in court. He certainly doesn't have um, an easy road ahead of him. Big decisions to be taken. And one of them is this question on fuel subsidy. Well, they have said, said they're going to remove it anyways. Yes, they've said they're going to remove it. But I know that Labour has said if what you're saying is that the price of petrol is going to go up, that they are not synonymous, that they are not going to take that. Everybody uh, can say they're going to remove petrol, the price, yeah. uh, pe uh, petrol subsidies. 
but that if that is also meaning that the price of petrol is going to go up, they are not going to have wait, it. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, unless we're They're not, not going same, to have it. Unless we're not in the same country with labor, because last time I checked, yes. petrol price has gone up how many times now? Way more than in the last eight years. Uh, no, not, not, not the type that you're talking about. You're talking about... Anyway, let us see what happens. To be honest, let us, let us not preempt the I've conversation. But I do know that that will not be an easy topic. That would not be an easy conversation to have. So bite the bullet. Page 8 is where you'll find details. Let's leave it there for Leadership Newspapers. Oh dear, interesting days ahead, clearly. Because I'm, I'm thinking about it, I thought that was what subsidy meant, <laughs> really. A sum of money granted by the state to help an industry or business. So if you're removing that help, in quote, you know what? <laughs> As you said, it's going to be very interesting. Go the dictionary, yeah. I, I mean, just I wanted to be sure because I thought that was all subsidy. That's what I know <laughs> subsidy as. But we'll take a look at Daily Trust newspaper. Ah, oh, interesting days ahead. But this one is on the old Naira notes. You see, Nigerians await decision, lament hardships. Traders reject notes, demand government's compliance. Order Apex Bank now. Ondo governor urges Buhari. Well, the president is in Qatar. So, uh, but you know, he works remotely. Remember that time? They showed us how the president actually works remotely. So it's not like uh, that should, should stop anything. And you see this other one, presidency, CBN, silent. And, uh, you know, just lots of things you want to just wrap your head around and understand. I mean, how did we get here? Is this a property? Is there something else we do not know about? But hey, that's where we're at. Silence? Right now. Well, what you, you heard that the CBN said they, are, they haven't received the memo. Yeah. Um, that's not to say there is no awareness. Because it's in the news, right? But you need the certified <coughs> true copy of that, that judgment. So, well, the, the, C, the uh, federal government was represented in the courts. So the federal government has the memo. The CBN was not a party to that in that case. The CBN is like a, a, a USB port. <laughs> On the computer called Federal Government. I must be very expensive <laughs> USB, USB port that actually prints money. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> that's, uh, that's a big one on Daily Trust. There's a picture. By the way, the case of Abuja needs to be investigated, maybe both physically and spiritually, because I don't understand why the fuel queues in Abuja defies logic. Last year, there were queues for most of the year. Started from like the beginning of the year up until I think they only had respite for a few months, really, and I keep wondering why. But below that picture that shows the kills is, ISWAP kills 200 Boko Haram terrorists and families in class. Yes, not the military. ISWAP kills 200 Boko Haram terrorists and families in class. That's, that's just the irony we're dealing with right now. But that's the Daily Trust newspaper for you. That's a very sad one, but I don't even know where to, what, what department to put that. Well, it's ISWAP killing Boko Haram. Last I checked, I mean, it looked like they, were, they should be on the oh, same page. I know they have internal conflict. But yeah, unfortunately, at the end of the day, they're human beings. So maybe, I mean, the you military know. will say maybe this is a win for... I don't even know. That's why I said it's a little, you know. But as for the cues that you mentioned, I guess uh, Maokwe and the new Abuja entrance, Chamberlain will be able to is speak this still to new, though? <laughs> 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 the Guardian newspaper is next, and this is what you have on its front page, and it's talking money. E-payment channels fail stress tests despite banks 901 billion naira profit. That's what you have on the front page of the Guardian newspaper right there. And it's quite a, it's, it's quite a stress test. Yeah, in, indeed. I it is quite a stress I test. I mean, imagine you do maybe three transactions per week or mm -hmm. per day. Now you have to do multiples, maybe times five. Imagine, that's a lot. I, I checked uh, some data because I, I was really curious what's the percentage of increase yeah. of uh, e-transactions over the past few months. It's gone up something in the region of more than 300%. So that's times three. So I don't even know where, how that is. So that is that, but that's what you have on the front page there. E-payment channels fail stress tests, despite banks 901 billion Naira profits. No respite from apps. USSD platforms as failure reaches peak after a hundred billion naira investments. That's um, the first of those ones. No respite, no respite from apps. And God, it's even interesting that your WhatsApp messages are going through. Your, you, you get all data services except your apps. 
<laughs> scary part, concerns as hackers wipe, oh God, 2.9 billion naira from fintech firm. Wow. Attack raises concerns over safety of digital first banks. Telecoms operators absolve selves of banking crisis. Nibs keeps mum on rate of e-payment transaction failures. And experts task financial institutions on secure e-payment space. That's uh, the big story on the front page. And as you can see, um, the, the major actors yeah. in the week that we're entering into, especially when it concerns your money, um, they are right there on the front page of the Guardian newspaper this morning. At the bottom of the page, Nara redesign Buhari CBN yet to respond to Supreme Court ruling three days after. That story is on page six. That's the Guardian newspaper this morning. Nigerian News Direct has this one on Nara redesign, as you'll expect. Buhari CBN keep mum over Supreme Court verdict. CPP Lord Supreme Court ruling on old currency notes validity. That's on page 23, and this one should interest you. IMF warns CBN, others of a rise in inflation. So, I mean, we had a case that looked like uh, too much money was chasing uh, the goods. Now, too much money is even chasing the Naira, because a lot of people are buying Naira for extra. So I, I, imagine, I would... Imagine, I, I'm, I'm, I'm yet to have my, wrap my head around that one. You have to use... Someone said last week, shortly after the Supreme Court ruling, mm -hmm. raised the alarm. Is this true? Because I just bought 200,000 naira with 60 something naira. 60 something thousand. Extra. Naira. So, I don't know. That's, that's, the, that's the reality for a lot of Nigerians. And uh, I would love to see the figures after this. Um, lots of figures, the, uh, the inflation figures, how this is impacted upon that. But like, that just gives you a picture, really. Uh, of all of that. And you see, Atiko's loss, Ayu Okowa, Tambowal PDP leaders to stage protest in Abuja. So uh, perhaps that's one of the possibilities that we're looking at as we started the show uh, this morning. A couple of other stories on the front page of the Niger News Direct. So they got all the resources to make all the plans for this country and then are we expected to, to say this is tenable? Make of that what you will. Uh, 2.1 billion liters of petrol in stock in Nigeria and NPCL says it has sufficient products to last 35 days as, this, or as they always say. Oil theft is liable for what? Explosion in rivers communities? Well, similar narrative, I guess. So we just do things the same way and we expect different results. <laughs> oh boy. I thought that was the definition of insanity. Well, the Abuja Inquirer is uh, the next one now and look at what you have on the front page. Cash crunch. F City residents await CBN. Apex Bank quiets in Supreme Court ruling. Private businesses suffer in Q1. In Q1, that's according to a report. So you might want to know what report uh, they're referring to, and uh, perhaps whether their suffering has anything to do with the cash crunch. You find details on page 11 of the paper.
Abuja natives kick over poor representation in 10th NAS. It's a page three read for you. They have a number of other stories. Just beneath the nameplate, Brain Drain, FCTA launches Health Workers Registry. The page six read, they're concerned about what is happening um, in the health sector. And just in case you're wondering um, about representation, there's a story, Iriti Kingibe. I think is a special from SDP, APC, PDP to LP, FCT, Senator elect. So quite a journey, but that's somebody who didn't give up, kept on engaging. If she had to change parties, she did. Um, and finally, she's FCT, Senator elect. Page three is where you find details. They have a number of other stories just right beneath the nameplate for you. Nigeria's airfare rose by 94.78% in 2022. That's according to the National Bureau of Statistics. So a high cost of living is certainly one of the issues uh, that will need to be battled. Let's leave it there for the Abuja Inquirer. Okay, so take a look at this Nigeria next. Polls, battle shifts to states. 29 states to get new second term governors march 11. Uh, horse trading as contestants who obedient followers ethnic religious groups across states INEC we are working towards hitch free governorship elections and then at the bottom strip here you see flawed electoral process may increase voter apathy say experts you don't need experts to tell you that, actually. Uh, urge INEC to maintain non-partisanship, because I think a lot of people can see that. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Naira redesign. Sarah wraps Buari on obedience to court orders. Low turnout characterizes NPC trial census. I don't know why we're having census at this point, really, because. I'm not sure how many people will be interested in that at this point in time. We can always have it later. So but if you see low turnout now, it gives you an inkling into what to expect when the real thing comes. So they need to put on their thinking cap and think. That is this Nigeria this morning. Uh, that wraps it up with a look at some of the dailies here this morning. We will be back in just a moment. Stay with us. From logistics, deployment of technology to personnel, some Nigerians believe the conduct of the 2023 presidential election fell short of standards. The result portal failed to run optimally in an election where 24.9 million people voted out of the 87.2 million people who collected their permanent voter cards, which means only three in 10 eligible voters turned out in that election. Voter apathy, a show of indifference towards electoral and democratic processes, isn't the only challenge in the just concluded election. There are also reports of violence and disenfranchisement. A lot of people had problem challenges um, voting for the candidate of their choice and they were technically disenfranchised during the presidential election 
Election observers from the European Union, the Commonwealth, and other bodies reported a range of problems, including failures in systems allegedly designed to aid vote manipulation. This in the Senate as follows. The electoral umpire seems to have learned some lessons and making efforts to correct some of these anomalies ahead of the governorship and state assembly elections. For 423... On the bright side, the INEC chairman insists that the February 25th election produced the most diverse national assembly since 1999. In the Senate, 98 out of 109 seats have been declared. So far, seven political parties have won senatorial seats, while in the House of Representatives, 325 out of 360 seats have been won by eight political parties. Joe Keodumaki monitored the election. She says there's a lesson for everyone. Most importantly, our people must keep away from fake news. They must remain peaceful at all times. We do not have any other country than Nigeria. We must never ballot with our blood. A Sinek perfects arrangement for the conduct of the governorship election. Nigerians hope that their expectations will be met through credible voting and transparent result collation processes that will reflect the will of the people by producing the most credible results. Dari Idu. Channels Television News. Welcome back, uh, Mr. Meketi, our senior advocate of Nigeria, joins us this morning. Good morning, and thank you for coming on today. Thank you, Chamberlain. Oh. Thank you, Nigerians and viewers. Yeah, what a weekend. Good morning. Good morning. What a weekend it is, actually, because um, quite a number of judgments that came through, and uh, several people just looking to see, for instance, just this particular one, which uh, affects a lot of things, is this cash one that happened uh, Friday, uh, and then already this morning, uh, many waking up to see the daily is reflected, and rightly so, how uh, there isn't any compliance in the marketplaces, in the banks, different perspectives, banks saying, well, they wait on CBN, CBN probably waiting on directly from the president, and then you wonder, how should, the, is that the way the process should be? First of all, let's start with you giving us your impression about how the judgment went. Did you see that eventually this was how it was going to be? Um, I, I did not see it come out this way um, because I had looked at the course of action and um, I realized that the course of action was basically challenging the policy, monetary policy of the CBN. And I sincerely believe that uh, uh, the Supreme Court was not the right venue. Yes, parties, Edo State and Bayasa State challenged jurisdiction, but the Supreme Court felt otherwise, felt they had jurisdiction and they indeed assumed jurisdiction. Uh, I believe that there, there was a course of action, but that course of action ought to have been commenced at the Federal High Court, even if it was an emergency. By reference, the matter could have come to Supreme Court sooner than uh, it would have gone if it was not referenced, you know. But the Supreme Court assumed jurisdiction and went on to uh, deliver its judgment. Uh, the Supreme Court judgment is final. You can only appeal to God. But again, the problem you are seeing now is the problem we identified when we said uh, there's a jurisdictional issue. Because uh, um, Central Bank of Nigeria, who in the main came out with that policy, was not made a party in the suit. And so judgment has come. There's no, uh, there's no direct directive on central bank on anything to do. The, the judgment is against the Federal Republic of Nigeria, you know. And so uh, it now behoves on the party that was sued to make sure that central bank complies with that particular judgment. You know, these are the issues. And the people who came up with that suit 
knew that Central Bank ought to have been a party in it. And if they indeed made Central Bank a party in it, then it will be more obvious that the Supreme Court does not have jurisdiction over the matter. I can also tell you that being a part of that suit, I was in court when Lagos State, apart from being part of the initial, uh, the, suit, the, the, the consolidated uh, uh, plaintiffs, co-plaintiffs in the main suit, they came up with a different suit. And in that different suit, you will see that Lagos State realized that there was a question of jurisdiction, and then they went ahead to now formulate a new case that had to do with Lagos State and federal government. So that is, that is the problem you see playing out. Central so what did they want hope to achieve with that particular strategy? So they wanted the Supreme Court to now go ahead and treat that their suit as a separate suit. But of course, the Supreme Court uh, is bedeviled with uh, quite a lot of cases. They don't, in fact, on the day the suit was had, the court made it obvious that they cannot begin to pick and choose which one to deal with, that they will deal with the main suit. And that is what I presume they did. So when, when you say the CBN wasn't a party to the suit, they ought to have been made a party to make it more clear. Mm. But we also do remember that Mr. Fadana told us several times that, well, the CBN themselves have benefited from cases that they were not directly parties to. So they cannot pick and choose when to plead or make a point as to we not being party to the suit, having benefited from a su such scenario before. Uh, the, the danger in listening to we lawyers is that we give you opinion based on where we stand. You cannot say because I have enjoyed um, a privilege or the largesse coming from a suit that I was not made a party. Now, when a suit that I'm not made a party comes, I must suffer for it. No, the law is straightforward. A principle of law is a principle of law. What about precedents? Isn't this a precedent already by itself? There's no precedent that says that if a judgment that a judgment that does not have your name will bind you. There's no precedent like that. So when you talk about principles, you get it right. When you talk about uh, if this happens, the other one will happen. No, you're not getting it right. And so, uh, and that is why the law insists that law is what the court says it is, not what a legal practitioner says it is. Okay, but right now, the courts have said, this is the position. Yes. Can CBN still claim not being parted to the suit and not... The, federal, the, the federal government has been directed and by inference, its uh, agencies. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying Central Bank should not obey. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you where the problem is coming from, where the issue is arising from. Mm. Now, the Central Bank will hide under federal government. If they were made a party, that would be an issue. So what the, what, the, the, what the, the plaintiffs will do now is to go after the governor of Central Bank how long does it really take for bureaucracy to, to, to kick in? Because as you said, by extension, I mean, if the federal government is the uh, one in the suit and its agencies are covered under the umbrella of the federal government, how long should we expect that it would take for the bureaucracy to, to kick in and the central bank get the directive that it needs to do what it needs to do? It takes for as long as the president of Nigeria decides to give the directive. Like when uh, he included the 200 naira note, old note, um, we didn't take anything. He just took uh, a statement from him. So a statement from him, a directive to the central bank governor, will work the magic. It doesn't take one week, two weeks. Okay. Well, we'll see how that eventually pans out. Uh, because for a number, I think the Supreme Court also wanted the politics of it. Do you think that, I mean, he wanted the politics of it to die down? Because I remember that before they finally had this judgment, he talked about how the Supreme Court will not be the scapegoat of, um, of anybody. And uh, there are big questions as to whether you think that sufficiently uh, the politics of it, I mean, whether or not this was supposed to stop vote buying, this was not supposed to stop vote buying, um, that controversy, do you think that sufficiently it has died down for people to be able to see what, you know, the, the issues that have been raised on their merit? I think the Supreme Court was smart enough because uh, on the day the suit was had, they were very, very uh, specific and deliberate that the Supreme Court and the courts will not be made scapegoat uh, in this matter. And they indeed had everything the same day. In fact, for the processes that were not yet filed, but there was an indication that they will be filed or they are being filed, the court said, who will hear all of them. And they indeed heard all of them and came up with their verdict. You know? So that's basically, uh, I can tell you that Supreme Court did well um, in giving expeditious uh, treatment to, 
to, to the matter. But my only issue, still be, it's still an issue for me, is appreciating that issue of uh, uh, jurisdiction. Mm. But, but they did well. When, when we hear scapegoats, people, it comes across with different people differently. Mm. So could you, I mean, did you understand that you could shed light on that for us, if you will, when they say we will not be made scapegoats? Because everybody thought, Supreme Court, I mean, courts usually will attend to cases that are before them. So wherein did this mindset of scapegoatism come in? Yes, it, it comes in because <clears throat> Supreme Court justices are human beings. They are Nigerians, and they have eyes, they hear, they read. <laughs> Even if uh, they wear their big wig and you don't see their ears, they the hear. You know? So the, what has happened is that, for example, in this era of pre-election matters, quite a lot of political parties refuse to do the correct thing. And these matters are pushed to the courts. And so nobody now begins to look at what the political parties did wrong. What the people are looking at is how the matters were adjudicated by the Supreme Court and indeed courts. And they say, no, don't stop pushing these things to us and we'll now become the fall guys. I thought they, they always say that the courts don't, it doesn't matter what happens in the court of public opinion. They decide their cases based on what is before them. But when you're talking about a political case, when you're talking about a political case, you don't shut yourself out from that. That is why a lot of people uh, criticize their judgments. Have you seen people sit back and criticize judgments of the Supreme Court that are uh, related to land matters, related to uh, one corporation or the other? No, people don't do it because they are not topical issues. They don't affect the people and their expectations. So what they are interested in is that political one where one plus one in their eyes should be two. And if it doesn't look like two, then they begin to talk. So, yeah. well, I know that I'm, I'm hoping that our colleagues in Lagos will be taking the conversation in that regard, or maybe they'll add whatever it is. But you do know that right now, quite a number of issues have now been raised as a result of the, uh, we just concluded, presidential elections. Yeah. Uh, talking about transmission of results, uh, what that was supposed to, ha to mean, uh, whether or not the FCT uh, counts as a state, or whether it's a separate entity by itself that has to, you know, you, a candidate has to fulfill 25% in the FCT as well. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, first and foremost, let's take on the issue of the FCT. Uh, some people say that uh, the FCT in the Constitution, in terms of the requirement, I think it's section 137 or so, um, I'm not very conversant, I have to double check that, um, in terms of what the, uh, the, the Constitution requires, that the FCT was meant to be treated as a separate entity. Others feel that no, the FCT is to be treated as a 37th state um, of the Federal Republic. I don't know, from your own reading, what do you make of um, that reading of the, of the FCT's inclusion? First of all, I'll tell you that whatever we're discussing and uh, Nigerians are discussing on this issue can be said to just be some academic exercise because the law is what the courts say they it are. Is. So that is, that, is, that is simple. But then I, I look at whether FCT is a state or is not a state. I don't think that is uh, in dispute. Uh, some people confuse themselves, saying that Section 299, Section 299 arrogates the status of a state to, to FCT. But that is not correct. It is not correct, and I'll read it. It's not correct. Yeah, I see that Section 299. Okay, Section 299... Section 299 reads, the provisions of this constitution shall apply to federal capital territory, Abuja, as if it were one of the states of the federation, as if it were. If it is one of the states, it won't be as if, as if it were. And the constitution here is discussing the administration of FCT, and it says you have to look at it the way states are looked at. To put it beyond conjecture, if you look at Schedule 1, Section 3 of the same constitution, it lists the states in the federation. FCT is not one. The states are enumerated one alphabetically from one to the end, from 
state number 30, uh, 1 to 36. And in law, it is, it is beyond conjecture in law. It is tried in law. It is settled in law. That when you have a list in a, in, in a legislation, any other thing that is not within that list, which ordinarily you think should be on the list, if it is not there, it is excluded, totally excluded. So FCT is not one of the states, and it is totally excluded from the states by the Constitution, which is the ground norm. So people saying it's a state. It is not a state. Many judgments have come. The Constitution says in 299 that it should be administered as if it were a state. The, 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 the language is very straightforward. So um, for people who are confusing this, uh, they are doing it deliberately. I can also tell you, that's why I tell you that people give opinion from where they stand. That provision of section 134, 134, is, yeah. the 134 is straightforward. We can also read it. 134 is very, 1342, 1342 is also um, there for everybody to see. It says, 1342B uh, says, talking about the candidate who will be declared the winner, he has not less than one quarter of the votes cast at the election in each of the, of at least two thirds of all the states in the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory. After talking about all the states, mm -hmm. it makes an extra mention of FCT, Federal Capital Territory Abuja, which means that there's something about FCT. I can also tell you that in the previous constitution, there was no mention of FCT because FCT was not in place then. When you talked about uh, Shagari and, um, and, um, and the UPN, uh, Lagos was the capital at the Lagos time. Lagos was the capital at the time, and Lagos was a, Lagos was a state. state. There was no need to mention it. Mm -hmm. But when there was now the 1999 constitution, in the wisdom of the drafters of the constitution, they added FCT. And somebody sits back and says, no, it does not matter. FCT is a state or should be considered as a state. We are looking up to the courts to make the mm. pronouncement. But what you see is people talking from their, their standpoint, where they stand. But I'll also tell you, which, and it's very important, whether FCT is to be considered a, um, a part of the 36 or not, what is, is, is not important now. What is important is that this has become a topical issue, and it's what we call a tribal issue. It is something that the court must resolve. It has elevated itself in the public discourse, in, the, in, the, in, 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 in legal discourse, as an issue that the, the Supreme Court must make a pronouncement on. So it is not easy for anybody to sit back in the comfort of his office or, and, and say it does not matter. The person is saying it's not matter because of where his political leaning is. But if you read it as it is, without adding or minusing, you know that there's something about FCT. Let's go to Lagos. Uh, thanks, Chamberlain. Uh, let me just follow up on that point, because a lot of people were looking to INEC to get some sort of clarity uh, on that provision. But from what we saw, INEC declared the results, uh, announced the results, declared a winner without speaking to that. And for some people, it was some sort of answer to the question saying, well, there was no need really to separate the FCT from, uh, from that, you know, the whole 36 states of the Federation. So first, INEC had said, because I remember, I think Malpo was asking Mr. Okoye uh, that, well, how will you approach this? And INEC said, well, we have senior advocates in INEC who would actually give us directive. And I imagine that this is uh, the directive or the interpretation given to them. Was it, uh, was it INEC's responsibility really to also come out with a position? Or is it INEC's responsibility first to come out with a position? Because you've said the court, but INEC clearly uh, sat with the SANs in its, uh, in its commission and sort of made a decision. So I don't know, did they have to go to the court to get some interpretation or that was in order? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the truth is that what is at stake in that election is so much that it is not something you just sit and then you, you wield your power because you can wield it. Even at the Supreme Court, I, I use Supreme Court for, as an example. There are matters that come to Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will say, oh, okay, I've had your, your, your own submissions, I've had your own submissions, but we're inviting two, three lawyers to come and address us on what they think should be the position of the law, amicus curia. And then these people come in without having any interest. They dissect the law, 
and then the Supreme Court will consider their submissions uh, together with the submissions of the parties and come up with a, a decision. If Supreme Court can do it, why won't INEC do it? INEC has access to very senior lawyers. They, uh, they, they also uh, uh, consult senior lawyers when they go for uh, defense of uh, their results. So why would they not do it? And like I, I, have, I have issues concerning the election. And you see that deliberately again, INEC is doing what it's doing. Um, Dr. Olisa Abakoba wrote a letter to INEC. It was widely uh, circulated, where he pointed the attention of the commission to this issue of, of FCT. And to show you that he was very selfless in his letter, he said, I don't have the answer. So you guys go and figure it out before you do anything. Olisa Abakoba wrote that. And you know, in his character, he normally does things like this in the interest of justice and the unity of the country, you know? And then what happened? They now came and made their return. It is not the only place where they made the return. It's not the only issue that they swept by the, uh, under the carpet. The issue of uh, the complaint of uh, manipulations in the result sheets, um, beavers not being um, uploaded, the parties, their agents, made so much fuse about it. They were promised that the commission will look into it. Indeed, the uh, Section 65.1 of Electoral Act gives INEC seven days to look into those issues before making a return. Did they do that? They did not do that. They just finished and right away. And they told everybody, if you're concerned, you go to court. Well, and you know there's this saying that if a wrongdoer does a thing that is wrong and tells you to go to court, it means that he's sure of what will come out of the court. Well, so and it advocate, is very sad because we're talking if, about the votes of the people. Right. The votes, even by the declaration made by INEC, even by that declaration, you see that the person that was said to have won the election did not score uh, um, uh, up, up, up to one third of the total votes cast, which means that there's something to be look, looked into. If I can the come in The Labour Party says we won in, Portaco, in River State. Right. We won here. With the votes that we were given in Lagos they do not represent our votes. We, 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 we have, and it's, it's in video. And then you go to the places where PDP won. You see how they, 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 their votes were also cut short. And they have these things in resource sheets. And they say, please, you need to revisit this. And the law says you should revisit it. There was no compulsion in announcing uh, the, the elect, uh, well, the winner of the election. Indeed, Section 70 even gives the commission up to 14 days before making a return. It says you can make that return within 14 days. Also, so now if I could what, just what come in. What was the haste? Right. Why would people be crying and you think it doesn't matter? Well, pardon me. I, I mean, some of the uh, points you made, I recall that um, the INEC chairman, he had a meeting, a meeting uh, with the uh, Rex across the state, and he, he said it again that, um, well, they have received petitions from political parties and I think even uh, civil society, and he acknowledged uh, those reports and said that they're being looked into and where infractions uh, can be established, uh, there will be redress. Those were his words uh, over the weekend. And, and I think now the, the debate is, uh, how do you decide whether INEC made the right choice uh, in announcing the results? First, is there a law that says that he can stop it uh, midway and, said, and says that he, he mustn't go ahead with it? Did he breach, or did the commission as a whole breach any law? Uh, some have argued again that, well, um, perhaps maybe that decision didn't swing the way uh, of some. That's why it is deemed to be, well, uh, perhaps the wrong decision to have been made. But again, uh, the point uh, about the, uh, the one-third, the 25%, just to be clear, uh, in what way should the Constitution have put it such that it will be clear enough for all to maybe understand. So we wouldn't have this debate because going by the letter by Dr. Agbakoba, he didn't even ask INEC to go to court. He just asked INEC to give an answer to Nigeria. And so again, in that light, it would seem that INEC was in order to have done its consultation in-house or whichever way it did it and come to that conclusion. Oh, yes. Um, of course, INEC may have done their, their consultation in-house and come up with a, a conclusion. But I am saying that those things were hasty. You know, <clears throat> Section 72 of the, of, of the Electoral Act gives them 14 days within which to announce results. What was the haste? 
Okay, you're talking about their power to review. Yes, INEC has power to review. Even at this stage that they have declared um, a winner of the election, they still have time. The, the Section 65 one gives them seven days. So even after declaring Tinubu the winner, they still have seven days to review it. So we are waiting. We are still within the seven days. Maybe by end of work today, or they would call and say, "No, um, we have a problem with that declaration." Who's supposed to trigger it? That's Section 65. The, the, the parties, the parties that are aggrieved, and I know they've made a representation to INE. Well, just just one you know, quick so question. So they are still within time. Yeah. You see, they are still within their seven days. But what they couldn't do before they declared, I doubt whether they will still do it now. Because well, they've told anybody that cares to go to court. Well, you already said it and yourself. that's where uh, we find ourselves. Mr. Tiaba, and that is, really, that is really yeah. sad. My apologies. You know, we saw, you know, these days we're not talking about. Yeah, just a second, uh, Mr. Tiaba. I mean, you already said it that, I mean, we, just only, we only need to wait for the authorities to do whatever it is that they need to do. But there's a question you raised, that some conversation you had when, um, you know, Malcolm was asking around uh, the uh, the Naira policy and the Supreme Court ruling on that, allow me to go there for just one bit. So if the CBN was not joined and the federal government was directly um, addressed in that judgment, how about the principle of vicarious liability? Doesn't that apply here? You know, we're, we're talking about vicarious liability is that somebody's wrong, somebody's wrong. If, you're, if, 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 if somebody commits a wrong, you, the principal, can be held responsible. Oh, yes, it, 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 but you cannot visit it on this. A court order must bind the parties. Now, well, I'm not even saying that it doesn't bind uh, CBN. That is not my, my take. My take is very simple. The people that formulated this case, they know they were proceeding against CBN, and they refused to make CBN a party in the suit, because if they made CBN a party, it would be more glaring that... So the uh, Supreme Court does not have jurisdiction over the matter. Now, they made the federal government, federal government, the party, and said, and their agencies. So we now present a case that will still need some interpretation to execute the judgment. There, there was no need for that. So what we now find is an issue around the way the plaintiffs crafted their reliefs and the parties to the suit. And I'm not saying that CBN shouldn't be bound by that judgment. But I'm talking about why these little issues are arising. When you know how to do things right, why do it the other way? You want to, uh, you want, you, you want to shortchange, short-circle the system. Why didn't you bring Central Bank into the suit of an issue? But you also why heard the Supreme Court federal government, so federal government can get CBN. My, my apologies. You also heard the, the, in that judgment of the Supreme Court arguing to the, you know, the uh, defendants that, look, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, the justices were concerned, that is the proper thing to do. The CBN shouldn't have been added in the, shouldn't have been made a party to the, to the case in the first place. And that's consequently, they made that decision, especially because the president, the, the CBN cannot go on without the CBN, and the, the, the president himself making a pronouncement according to uh, the CBN Act of 2007. I'm actually not in a position to sit um, uh, on appeal over Supreme Court judgment, and that's why I'm not going into the merit. Uh, I can tell you that all Supreme Court does is good, but the truth about it is there are issues that are still unresolved, and they are revolving around that, uh, the formulation of the parties to the the suit. Well, I hope it doesn't affect the, the, the Naira this week because people need Naira to spend. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I think the markets just want this thing sorted once and for all. Uh, I know you need to run. Uh, by the way, couldn't CBN have just applied to join in this suit? We know we see that all the time. If, if they had applied to join, uh -huh. the issue is very straightforward. They, they don't have the capacity to walk up to the Supreme Court and say, join me in a suit, because you can only be joined in a suit if ab initio you could have been a party. The uh, Central Bank couldn't have been a party in this suit, so no person can join them. Oh, okay. Well...
we just want this naira out there <laughs> basically above all else so we'll hope to see how that happens today uh it's a monday so I'm, I'm not sure there should be any further reason for this not to be resolved we do thank you for coming on this morning mr meketi our senior advocate of nigeria we will be back in just a moment stay with us He joins us virtually this morning. Good morning, Mr. Fan. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, it, it's um, it's a scenario that lots of people are looking to see. Yes, the build-up to the Saturday's election. We know that INEC had a meeting with uh, resident electoral commissioners, and many uh, expected that they would have gone through what happened uh, for the presidential elections and then look forward to the next election. So if you could give us the benefit of hindsight, do we have any cause of concern looking forward to this weekend's election in light of what transpired in the last presidential elections? Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. As you know, the... Um, this Saturday is set for the governorship and House of Assembly elections across the country, and we are planning towards that. Um, we have um, learned certain lessons from the last uh, two weeks ago, the presidential and national assembly elections. And when we had the meeting with the commission over the weekend, we had discussions on this. We considered areas that we needed to improve upon, and um, each of us resident electoral commissioners was uh, expected to make sure that when we go to our seats, we ensure that this is complied with. And so we are working towards that. We hope that uh, we are working towards having um, the elections this Saturday and improving on what happened in the previous election that we had on uh, um, February 25th. Well, as it is now, um, I know that uh, all of that meeting, because some of them were behind, the press was not in those meetings. So I am sure you also kept tabs in terms of what transpired. So now that um, the elections will be holding, the big question was uploading those results to IREV. I don't know, I mean, your state will not be having uh, governorship elections, but you will have other elections. So what is it that you, as a commission, how are you going to execute that this Saturday? Well, um, so in a dossier, we are going to have the House of Assembly elections um, to the 24 uh, um, constituencies, state constituencies. And in other states, they're also going to do all the House of Assembly elections. Some states will do the governorship election as well. But in each of these places, when elections are, of course, you know that elections are won and lost at the polling units. And so we'll deploy to the polling units. People will come out and vote. Their, result, their votes will be counted. Results entered into the result sheets. Uh, copies of the results will be given to agents of each of the parties uh, contesting the election. A copy would also be given to the security agencies. And um, the, um, the beavers would be used to take the snapshot of that result, which is what is uploaded onto the uh, IREF portal. And then the physical result is taken to the ward for the ward collation. And uh, when the ward collation is completed, they also take it to the local government level, depending on uh, for the State House of Assembly seat. In some local government areas make up just a constituency. So it means that at the time it is tabulated at the local government level, at that point, a declaration can be made 
as to who has won the election for that constituency seat. Uh, for some uh, very large local government areas, they have more than one uh, state constituency. So it would then mean that we know the words that make up which constituency. Okay. So after the words calculation uh, has been done, uh, they would be taken to the various constituency collation points where this would be collated and then results announced and winners declared. So in relation to perhaps one will ask if this result will be uploaded on IREV in real time, could you explain what the people will see or what are they expected to see play out with respect to okay, so, live real time so, viewing of results? Okay, so when the election is ended in a polling unit, the votes are sorted, the ballots are sorted and, the, uh, and counted, and the uh, record is, rec uh, is recorded for each political party in the, is recorded for each political party in the um, result sheet for that polling unit. Members of the public would also witness this. There's um, a result sheet that is a poster size that would be written out and pasted at the wall there in the polling unit. But the one that is in the, res the uh, result sheet from EC8A, that's what they'll use the beavers to take a snapshot of. And that is what is uploaded onto the IREV. And so once it's been uploaded onto the IREV, and they, when they go for the word collation and that result is admitted, then people will begin to see it uh, because the, the rate at that point will now uh, ensure that the, the result that has been uploaded is the same thing as the one that has been brought in the physical result sheet. It, it needs to uh, confirm that and also confirm that it matches with the number of registered voters that the BIVAS has recorded. And then he will enable that which has been uploaded to be seen mm -hmm. online. Well, my colleagues will ask further questions on that one, but I just need to ask you this. Um, I will check the IREV, and then we saw in some states where the, what they uploaded was not any of these forms in question. The person wrote that the form in question is missing, so they, they took a sheet of paper, failed results on that paper, and uploaded it. Is that supposed to be tenable? Well, that, that's a bit strange. Uh, uh, but you see, the truth is that what is actually collated manually is the result that is brought physically, which is the form EC8A. Remember, I said this is entered manually into a form. Uh -huh. And this is the original of that form that is taken to the World Collation Center for Collation. And I also said that copies of that original form because the form comes in multiple of copies. Copies of that result are also given to party agents. So assuming anything went uh, uh, wrong with the result, the physical result from when it was recorded at the polling unit and when it gets to the ward collation center, the good thing is that the party agents have their own copies of the results sheet. So if there's a dispute, they can bring this to tender and then a decision can be made as to if that is valid, and, and that would be admitted. The, the point needs to be stressed that every uh, party that is in the contest is entitled to um, a polling agent, and that polling agent is given a copy of the results at the polling unit. Even at the uh, uh, collation level, so at all the levels of collation, copies of the collated results are also given to the party agents. So they can actually trace if there is uh, anything that has gone wrong, maybe the figures has changed or there's mutilation after it had moved from the polling unit. So with their own records, they can actually uh, come forward and show that there's been a, a manipulation. Well, Mr. Afanga, let me take you up on, you know, what transpired last week, uh, Saturday. Um, we, all, we saw a situation whereby, because I, I think INEC eventually admitted that there were glitches to the system, even though it did so a bit belatedly. And with the reports of, uh, you know, polling unit officers trying to upload uh, the, uh, the polling re unit results on the IREV portal, but that wasn't happening. And as a result, a lot of um, people were not allowing the polling unit officers leave the polling units 
without that upload. I, I want to know what was the experience of the presiding officers in, in the state where you superintend and how, how did you handle that? Well, I didn't have a um, record of uh, presiding officers being um, harassed or, or detained, as it were, because they could not upload that. Truly, I didn't have that. I'm not saying that all our results got uploaded uh, uh, from the polling units there. Um, maybe the people here had an understanding or it was explained to them. But let me also say, strangely, that um, on that election day, I got calls from other parts of the country, from friends who were at the polling units, and they were explaining that, well, what is the process of uploading? And I was explaining to them. At that point, truly, I didn't know there was a glitch uh, on the system. So I explained to them what they needed to do, um, how they needed to get that uploaded. I even got one of my technical persons uh, in my state office to explain to them what was happening. And I remember in one of the states, a young person called me and said, they have finished the election. There is a problem of the upload. They, they, they won't let the presiding officer leave until that is uh, done. So I asked a few questions and I assured them that to the extent that they all have, they have seen the results there physically. And some, uh, some of the party agents also have the copies. That that shouldn't be much of a problem because um, the problem may not be that of the presiding officer. I think some people actually thought the presiding officers were playing games. They didn't want to upload. But at some point, that was uh, uh, um, pointed out that it was a, a, a technical problem with the system. So what I would advise, please, is that assuming that were to happen, that uh, uh, we should be, uh, 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 be protective of the people who are conducting the elections. I mean, the young person who is a presiding officer, many of them are youth corps members serving in communities far from, from where they come from. Uh, and we know that we should actually uh, watch out for, for, the, for the welfare in those kind of situations. We shouldn't meet out um, the frustration that we may face with, uh, with the system on these young persons who are the uh, point of uh, election being conducted and trying to upload the results. I assure people that the results will still go through. And more importantly, the political parties at the polling unit would have a copy, would have their copies of the election results at that point. Mr. Fowler, just uh, issue uh, and perhaps the response to uh, Chimelis. The response to uh, Chimelis. Do you have? Is there a document with INEC to to ascertain that, as you said, party uh, agents did get the results from the polling units? Okay, so at the end of uh, uh, each election, when the results are recorded in the result sheet, there's a column for each party agent to sign against the party on the result sheet at the polling unit. Well, not signing for it does not vitiate that result, but party agents at that level sign for it, and they are given copies of the result sheet. Well, well, we understand that there are quite a number of um, polling units that didn't have polling agents. And as you said, doesn't vitiate the authenticity or otherwise of the, of the results. But what's the significance of that? Because if they do not have it and they go ahead and publish whatever it is that they want to publish, what are the implications? Okay, so let me, let me uh, uh, stress this again, the process. Every political party that is part of an election is entitled to have a polling agent. And they were given the time to file in with the polling agents at each point we're going to be at each of the polling units, uh, each of the uh, ward coalition centers, each of the local government coalition centers, at the state coalition level, and even at the national coalition level for the presidential election. They, they submitted this online with the passport photographs of these agents. And I actually produce the tax for each agent with their photographs on them. They send this to the state and the political parties collected this from us. So if a political party did not have its own agent in a, a polling unit, then 
they cannot blame somebody else if anything went wrong and they didn't have the records of that. But I don't know, I, I don't think that there is any polling unit that did not have a party agent. Maybe not all the parties that contested in the election had polling agents, but there were enough polling agents in each of the uh, uh, polling units across the country. And as we go for this uh, election on Saturday, the governorship and House of Assembly election, I imagine that every party um, that is interested and serious in the race would also would also um, have their agents at that point. Now, even assuming they don't have agents there, there may be other parties that had agents and would have the results given to them. And also a copy of the results is also given to the uh, law enforcement agency as represented by the police there. And I also said that there's a poster size result sheet that is also filled with that result and left at the polling unit. It is pasted at the polling unit or hung at the polling unit in such a way that members of the public who are there can see the results. And we've seen people also take snapshots of such results, um, uh, poster size results that are, that are left at the polling units. So at that point, it's something that is well known to everyone. The, the result is displayed there, apart from the fact that the original copy of the result would be taken to the ward coalition center for the coalition. Well, although there are those who also say that sometimes when the results are pasted, as you said, on the wall, some people who lost or who are not pleased with the result could pull it down. But that's another matter altogether. Speak yes, to this I one, Mr. Fanga. Uh, there, there's what happens. How should people take um, result sheets that are bandied all over the place, some perhaps even on the IRF portal, that have cancellations upon cancellations uh, that have some form of mutilation of those numbers or readjustment or realignment of those numbers. What happens in that case? What, what substantiates that uh, that is a verifiable result? Couldn't it have been rewritten or something? Please help us understand what happens in that case and what are the implications? Well, we would have to treat each case on its own merits. So um, every polling unit has its results. And uh, like I said, a snapshot of it is taken at the polling unit before it goes uh, to the ward for collation. And <laughs> let me stress again, that political parties are given copies of the results. So if what you eventually see on the IREF is the one that has multiple, uh, uh, a lot of mutilations, uh, cancellation, then if what the political parties, for instance, had is different from that, then you can raise a legitimate uh, issue about that. It's also possible that the cancellation and mutilations happen even at the polling unit. It could have been an honest error by the presiding officer who recorded it, who may have made a mistake, and finding out the mistake corrected it, that could happen. So it also depends on how much of the errors you see there. Uh, but like I said, the uh, election results uh, that is eventually collated can also be matched with what the political party mm -hmm. agents also had and what uh, appeared on uh, uh, the uh, IREF as captured by the Beavers. So if you've seen something online when you go to the IREF, that shows a lot of mutilation, um, then we can question that. But you can only question that if you bring another copy that you claim is the authentic result, and then you can now, uh, a decision can now be made as to which one is actually the result. Because like you said, a lot of things are flying over the, um, uh, over the internet that uh, we'll need to be sure that those things are actually picked up uh, from the, from the IREP, or they actually represent what was submitted as a result from the polling units. Right. I mean, I imagine you were at that meeting over the weekend where the chairman of INEC again promised uh, that uh, the BVAS will be used uh, during this coming election. So clearly, BVAS is a critical uh, part of the success or otherwise of this election. So it would be good to also maybe troubleshoot it as, as the case may be. Help us understand because there were reports, series of reports that uh, some of the INEC officials were uh, given the wrong password. 
uh, for the beavers. And that will be a lot, I mean, major concern for Nigerians who will be going into this coming election. So is that a possibility? Uh, is that going to happen again if it happened uh, the last time out? Okay, I cannot uh, verify that uh, uh, that happened, where, uh, that people were given the wrong password or code. Um, but uh, what we have agreed to do, which is normal actually, is that even going to this uh, uh, Saturday's election, we're still going to do more training for the ad hoc staff. Uh, we have started doing that. Some of the local government uh, electoral officers have started having uh, refresher trainings for these ad hoc staff. So we're going to have refresher trainings for them in case some of them may have, um, uh, on election, they may have forgotten what they were supposed to do. But we, we are sure that um, we will train our personnel very well to be able to uh, know what to do on election day. So that shouldn't be, I don't expect that to happen if it had happened earlier. Right. I don't expect that to happen. And we've also taken note of uh, pool officials who may not have uh, worked optimally. And we've decided that such persons would not be part of this um, uh, Saturday's election. Right. And this so, includes not only not only those at the polling unit, but also even people who were uh, involved in coalition. Right. I think a major downside also is the upload, which a lot of people notice. So also speak to this. Uh, there were cases where we saw ourselves, uh, people's pictures uh, were on the IREV, uh, different polling units uh, result was uh, put for another polling unit. First, how is that even possible? Because again, that, uh, that speaks directly to the transparency, integrity of the IRF portal, which a lot of people have said is a game changer, even the chairman of INEC itself. So how is that possible? Is that again going to happen? And you can add to that what the report we got that, you know, national assembly results are being uploaded, but not the presidential uh, election results. I know I've put together about three issues, but I'd like, to, I'd like you to speak to them uh, before we head over to our Abuja studio. Okay, so I've said that we are going to have a, a refresher training for the uh, officials who are going to be involved in this. And um, we expect that uh, they should perform better than they did in the previous election, uh, 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 the presidential and national assembly election. Um, we want uh, to be given... Uh, to perfect this, uh, so we need to... Do this. Yeah, sorry, we're just getting some feedback on this one. So let me just ask you as you wind down on this. At what point is, for instance, your, uh, your state, I mean, because you are, okay, I think we lost Mr. Farhan there, but just trying to put out, uh, just get some clarification concerning his state, since he will be administering it. Because the thing is, they all need to know the importance of communication. Because right now, you have a lot of core members who are going to be out there performing their duties. On the day, you have several other electoral officers who will be performing those functions. So we wanted to find out from Mr. Farah, at what point is it that uh, communication is going to go out to the public? Because we already know that several people were not exactly pleased with what played out last weekend concerning the presidential election. So how is the commission going to communicate to the people? If, one, if something fails, if they can't view real time, are you considering improving communication so they don't carry out their anger on innocent people to ensure that things go on smoothly, for instance? Can you hear me, Mr. Fan? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, I was just, just trying to find out from you, since you will be directly responsible for your state. Part of the challenge the last time was communication. You know, lots of people were really miffed about what was going on. They didn't get communication as they thought that they were going to in good time. So are you going to do things differently in terms of passing messages out to the public? Because if they expect certain things to work in a certain way, as the commission has said, 
and it doesn't because the people they are directly in communication with or in contact with physically are the UCOM members and the electoral officers who are out there. So in order not to jeopardize or put them in harm's way, are you considering perhaps looking for alternative ways or different ways to communicate to the public in quick enough time so they don't jeopardize anyone or carrying out any anger or suspecting anything whatsoever? Oh yes, when, if we get uh, information about something going wrong in the field, we should be able to do that. And um, on election day, uh, we are quite busy receiving calls. We have um, a, a center that uh, takes uh, reports from the field. And sometimes if it is necessary, they escalate to me and I try to address that. If it's something that needs uh, me to um, escalate uh, to uh, headquarters, I also do that. So, so that 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 would happen, and um, it happened in the previous election, and uh, I will also ensure that no of that happens. Sometimes, what one needs to do may not necessarily be to send out a message directly to the public. It could be sending messages across the uh, security uh, uh, services. Remember, we have the interagency consultative committee on election security. So sometimes those things bothered on security. And so I had to uh, inform the security chiefs and they re responded uh, uh, timelessly to those situations as, as they occurred. And if it was uh, something that had to do with our operations, we made sure that the appropriate electoral officer responded to that. All right, just one more thing before you go. I, I know in that meeting that you had, was there anyone who perhaps raised it in the meeting that uh, people don't actually buy this glitches narrative of the commission because many people told us, look, we don't, we don't buy this narrative that there were glitches here and there. They think it was somewhat deliberate. Well, you are asking me to discuss uh, the details of what we discussed at our meeting, which was a, a close meeting. I'm, I'm afraid I won't do that. But uh, be assured that uh, we considered all the issues and we looked at uh, the way forward. And um, we are sure... Uh, the chairman has assured Nigerians that uh, going forward, uh, we'll make sure that everything works perfectly well. No, I didn't ask that. I only just asked that were there people who raised those concerns because imagine that the commission would be in touch with the people because you are there for the people to get direct feedback. So people need to know that they can have confidence in NINEC. That's all we're asking. Yeah, that, that, that's what I'm, I've also answered, that we admitted uh, that there were glitches. We were told that uh, what happened on that day and what was uh, done to resolve it. And uh, the assurance is that um, we won't have that again in the future election. Okay, whether I came from within or without. All right, thank you uh, very much indeed, Mr. Oboe Farah. Thank you very much. We're back in a moment, stay with us. Yes, indeed, uh, Chinedu Onyezu joins us next. He is the Labour Party senatorial candidate for Abia South in the February 25th elections. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Thank you. Well, you have been up in arms about what transpired on that day, and you're not happy with the results. In fact, you uh, speak strongly against the results declared by the commission. Could you tell us why? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Chamberlain, um, democracy... Uh, is a uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, but on Saturday, the 25th of February, INEC redefined democracy as a government of INEC, for INEC, and by INEC. I experience, I, and I say it everywhere I go to, uh, the worst form of travesty of uh, justice uh, on that day. Uh, we are looking at a scenario where I won my election as a, as a candidate of the Labour Party in Abia South. And, uh, you know, on the Tuesday, early morning Tuesday, when the election results were just being uh, collated, uh, you know, the returning officer, uh, the INEC returning officer uh, for Abia South in the zone, uh, declared the elections inconclusive because uh, over 108 pulley units 
in my strongholds, you know, didn't experience any form of uh, elections. And, uh, you know, she declared every uh, coalition officer accepted that position of uh, INEC. Only for, after, only for her to return after five hours with over five uh, trucks loaded with uh, military personnel and uh, mobile police uh, to uh, announce a winner uh, within five hours. And we have video recording of uh, these things playing out. Uh, in that uh, scenario, she said on video that uh, she got uh, instructed from Abuja to return back to the coalition, uh, Zona Coalition office and uh, declare Senator Abaribe as the winner of an inconclusive election. So uh, we are curious as Nigerians, uh, uh, at the minimum, to understand what's changed between the time she had declared the elections inconclusive and then five hours after she returns to tell every Nigerian that uh, uh, she has been instructed to uh, declare Senator Abaribe as the winner of the election. What she has done is to disenfranchise the votes of over 40,000 registered voters with PVCs, you know, that are supposed to vote in about 108 uh, polling uh, units in my, within my uh, strongholds. Uh, interestingly, too, you know, such scenarios played out in other parts of the country, and the elections were declared inconclusive, after which INEC, you know, um, uh, came up with a press release uh, um, suggesting that supplementary elections were going to be held in those uh, uh, um, areas, you know, so that uh, we can have a way of, uh, you know, arriving at uh, a winner uh, for the elections. So, uh, so uh, I'm rejecting, as a, as a candidate, I'm rejecting those uh, uh, declarations, and I'm calling on INEC, I'm calling on uh, Professor uh, uh, Yakubu uh, Mahmoud, uh, the national chairman of INEC, to, uh, to do the right thing. Uh, there is no order that could come from Abuja that is uh, above constitutional provisions, which is clear in the Electoral Act. If the difference between the uh, declared winner and the first runner-up is less than the total number of um, total number of uh, registered voters with PVCs, you know, you don't tell us uh, they wake up and declare one you know, of the candidates as the winner. That's part of the challenge. They say that you are relying on total number of accredited uh, registered voters rather than total number of uploaded accredited voters. And they say that that's where you get the calculation wrong. Is that right? No. Um, so, uh, so there are a lot of issues. Uh, firstly, the results sheet that we got a copy of, the, the final results sheet that we got a copy of, if you tabulate the numbers that we are captured uh, for uh, Senator Abaribe, it even sums up to, uh, it sums up to 38,000 votes, while mine uh, is 43,000 votes. But then how they arrived at 49,000 for Abaribe is still a mystery. That's one part of it. And then the other uh, aspect to it is that we have published uh, total number of registered voters in the 108 polling units. I mean, these are INEC records, you know. So, uh, so, so we are going to, we are, we are heading to the tribunal. Um, but, um, but registered voters, okay. as you said, because I also know that at some point, INEC uh, re released the published a number of uh, people who had picked up their PVCs, not just registered voters. Correct. So in terms of the 2023 elections now, we know that we have over 93 million registered yeah. voters, but only 86 million or thereabout picked up their PVCs for these elections. The difference of uh, close to is that 7 million people have not yet picked up their PVCs. So do you have the figure for your own senatorial district in terms of how many people have picked up their PVCs? Okay, um, <clears throat> we don't have an ex exact figure of how many that have picked up their PVCs, but um, looking at the number of people that uh, have registered or registered in the areas that we are disenfranchised, we are looking at over 40 
thousand registered voters. Um, um, uh, uh, Twenty percent of that is eight thousand. The, the difference between the um, um, the the candidate that was announced winner and and myself is 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 less than that number. So what we are saying is, if he thinks he's a more popular candidate, why they hurry to um, uh, uh, to to go out there, you know, to have INEC, you know, declare him winner when when we have a lot of Nigerians that are still disenfranchised, and and, and then there are a lot of irregularities. I saw some of the clips of your previous programs where you know uh, um, man, man, um, result sheets we are manipulated or you know um, 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 rewritten, yeah, yeah, especially at the collation level, you know. So what we are doing now is. We are pulling together our pulling unit level results. Uh, have you been to the IREF portal? Yes, we've been there. And then uh, we also have seen a lot of difference. You know, these are things that our lawyers are going to present at the All right. tribunal. Let's go to Lagos. All right. Uh, thanks, Chamberlain. Uh, just from your account, the account you narrated earlier on, uh, you said that um, uh, the, was, is it the REC or the person in charge of the election said, there was an order from Abuja. Uh, did that person say who the order was from Abuja? Because Abuja can mean really anything. But according to your account, did you get uh, who, the, who gave that order from Abuja specifically? Or it was just from Abuja? Yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, that is what we expect to get out of the court. Uh, what we saw and what we have on record, uh, on video recording, is that uh, is, is that, you know, we, 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 we saw her say that, we saw and heard her say that, you know, uh, she got order from Abuja to go ahead uh, and declare uh, 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 Senator Abaribe uh, the winner of the, uh, of, this, of the senatorial election. Oh, you said you've been to the IREV, and I imagine like a lot of other Nigerians who've been going to the IREV, they've tried to pull down uh, polling units uh, results just to tabulate and see how it reflects uh, with what INEC announced. And I wonder for you, uh, what did you come to in total uh, from the result from IREV for you and then uh, the candidate who was declared a winner in that election? Uh, so um, I will allow for my lawyers to present that. Um, it, it, it's not... Uh, uh, what I'm happy to speak to here, but then uh, I'm, 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 I can tell you that uh, uh, from 1,708 pulling units in my uh, state, uh, in my senatorial uh, zone, uh, we uh, we see about 1,000, um, you know, 1,400 uh, results sheets that have been uploaded, uh, uh, and we are expecting more uh, if I, if INEC continues to say that uh, the uploads are. Uh, ongoing, you know, so, but if after seven days we have not, they have not been able to uh, complete the upload of results in 1,708 uh, pulling units, um, we will also want to know why, uh, if, it is as, if it is also as a result of uh, uh, disenfranchising uh, uh, um, voters in the remaining uh, pulling units. So what we ask for is a rerun in those areas where voters have collected their PVCs and uh, are willing to vote. I'm not comfortable that uh, these areas are my strongholds. And uh, you know, INEC wasn't able to conduct uh, elections in those places. Well, uh, so the difference between the, uh, well, from IREV, it says there are 1,707 polling units. So that's just uh, one less of the 1,708 which you talked about. But uh, as of now, 1,484 polling units have been uploaded. So that leaves 223 uh, polling unit results still uh, outstanding, uh, waiting to be uploaded. And you said that, uh, I think, did you say 108 uh, polling unit results had not come in at some point when it was declared inconclusive. I just want to know what what then your demand is. Are you asking that the results should still be, uh, as, or rather the election itself, should be declared inconclusive and there should be some sort of uh, re-election or uh, recon reconduction of the process? Are you asking to be declared winner, perhaps based on what you have tabulated? What exactly are your demands? Okay, I'm demanding for the rights of Nigerians to 
their fundamental rights to vote uh, to be you know um, um, to be given to them, and the only way to do that is to conduct supplementary elections in these uh, polling units where elections didn't hold. How many are uh, there? It's in unfair total? to arrive at a conclusion uh, when you know that uh, uh, these areas are my strongholds. They are the Aba, they are polling units in Aba North, Aba South, and the uh, Obingwa area. You know, so I'm asking for. Uh, a rerun or um, a conduct of supplementary elections in these areas so that every Nigerian, the world will be able to uh, um, see why or uh, we, we, we will all have a clear explanation on whoever emerges as the winner. And I'm very confident because they are my stronghold. So why will you rush to declare Abaribe as the winner of the election? when you still have seven days to 12, 14 days uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, correct those wrongs or make sure that uh, supplementary elections are held uh, uh, before, election, uh, before a winner is declared. Did you have um, party agents in every single one of those polling units you're talking about? Yes, we, have, we, we had uh, party agents in, in those polling units. And then we, we started, we have our, uh, um, uh, we started collating our manual, uh, the, the printouts uh, of the um, result sheets. How significant are And they... I tell you, they are showing different, they are also showing different. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, a total uh, number of votes from what we have um, on IRIF and, and also what uh, was uh, announced. Okay. You know, so, but these details will come by the time we, we go to the tribunal. I ask that question because there are many people who say, you know, some observers say that there are parties who didn't have polling agents at the party agents at many of these polling units. So that's why I'm asking if you can confirm affirmatively that your party agents were there and they brought in authentic results, not one that they made up themselves. Yeah, so you, 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 you agree with me that Southeast, when we talk about Labour Party stronghold, Southeast is, uh, uh, you know, it's a region where uh, Labour Party is strong. So we, we have um, um, a very strong presence in, in the Southeast. So all our polling units had our, our uh, agents in, in them. Uh, the ones that didn't return with results are polling units where elections didn't hold because materials didn't even get there. So we, are, we had a scenario where voters waited for INEC to uh, come with uh, materials, voting materials, and they didn't show up. And uh, yeah, so, so for, the, for where we had elections, uh, we have our own, um, we have our own uh, um, copies of, of the polling unit results. Isn't it because part of the argument we hear from the other side is that uh, you were, uh, Labour Party was beaten in four out of the six local government areas. And that even if it has to do with the units that there was no voting, that I could have looked at the, they looked at the margin and saw that, well, the margin of accredited voters is less than the margin of win. And then I declared the result. Well, so um, let them make it public. You know, let them make the data that is that they are relying on to, you know, come up with that conclusion public. But then, before now, the INEC returning officer, who was part of the collation process, in the early hours of Tuesday, when they finished the collation, was on, on, uh, was on a video recording. You know, she was recorded on video because every other person, uh, most of the collation officers brought out their uh, camera phones to video her announced that there are a lot of irregularities, there are a lot of pulling units where elections didn't hold, and that based on the data she's seen, that she can't arrive at a conclusion. Okay. And so that elections are going to be held in these areas. In fact, that morning, too, over, over seven radio stations in Abia South had announced to Nigerians, uh, to voters, that uh, INEC was going to conduct supplementary elections. Only for after three, uh, five hours, the same lady returned back to the collision center to say that uh, 
you know, she was going uh, to, to, to declare a uh, winner, uh, winner for, you know, from the elections. Have you applied for a review? Yes, I've petitioned INEC, and then um, my lawyers are working on, uh, you know, heading to the tribunal so that we can do a review, do a look back on what has transpired. Do you regret going into politics? No, I, I, I don't at all. I actually uh, retired uh, from Chevron. It was an early retirement. I, I used to work at Chevron. I used to be a manager at Chevron. Uh, again, because of the passion I have for us to bring change to, uh, to the country and what happens in, in Nigeria, you know, that was why I joined politics. And, you know, I contested with what I consider the strongest opponents, uh, the two incumbents in uh, Abia South, I contested uh, with the incumbent governor of Abia State. I contested with the incumbent senator, a 16-year senator uh, representing Abia South. And I contested as the most prepared and qualified candidate. And that was why I got the kind of followership and votes that uh, I got in Abia South. So uh, there is no regret uh, because uh, the driver remains to bring change you know, transformational change to uh, my people. All right, Chinidu Onyuzu, the senatorial candidate for Abia South senatorial election. Thank you for coming on, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Let's take a look at some messages. I think we can or can't we? Well, this one comes from uh, Ola Gunju Oladele, the very first of the messages here. And he says, uh, it's a tweet actually, he says, every law requires interpretation and application which exclusively belong to the Supreme Court, not to the executive, not to the National Assembly, not to the media. We didn't claim it actually. Uh, <laughs> not practicing lawyers, not the clergy, not the public in general. Well, indeed, the law, I mean, the, the courts, not just the Supreme Court, the courts have, you know, exclusive interpretation of our laws. Mm -hmm. However, I mean, as Mr. Etiaba did say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we're doing is very similar to an academic exercise, which is supposed to <laughs> deepen our understanding of the laws. Well, first, uh, Sakimbo Iwa has this one. While the process of conduct of our presidential election fell short of our expectations, politicians must stop showing disdain for our democratic norms and institutions. Politicians must also be careful not to dub INEC as enemies of Nigerians. It's dangerous. We'll take a look at this email from uh, Gaza Gabriel, and uh, it's, it's another angle to this one. It says, uh, raising tension by religious clerics, saying there are videos, so many videos flying uh, on the internet, inciting religious dominance by either the Muslims insisting on Muslim-Muslim tickets in all the state, or the Christians saying it is time we produce Christian governors too. Says the earliest we talk about it, the better. Religion will be a great divide in Nigeria if not handled with care, and there will be no future for our children and the future generations. It's about time we all realize that there is no such thing as religion or preference in the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and consequently, there is no state religion, mm. no matter which way you look at it. Well, well, yes, indeed. Uh, that is the show today. We do thank you all for your time. We'll see you again next time. I'm Chamberlain Uso. Thank you for watching. I'm Maupe Ogu Yusuf. Well, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your morning. We wish you the very best today. I'm Kyle Okinkulu. And have a wonderful day and a lovely week. I'm Ayo Makini.